Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy, uh, happy season's premiere of Walking Dead Day. Um, or as it may be called in your house, happy Valentine's Day. And good to remember while we're in church on this day that we're loved more than we can ever imagine by a God who knows us a lot more than we'd like. Uh, last Sunday we started to look at the Bible and we started to uh, look at whether or not it had any wisdom that might help us think through our relationship with religion. And I told you last Sunday that there was a group of people in the first century who lived in a place called Galatia who had become Christians, they'd heard about Jesus, they started to follow Jesus, and it was all going pretty well for them. Uh, it was all about Jesus, it was all about Jesus, it was all about Jesus, and Jesus was enough. And then sometime after that, a group of religious experts from Jerusalem visited this church and they began to muddy the waters a wee bit. Uh, they said to the church, Jesus is fine. I'm into Jesus, you're into Jesus, we're all into Jesus. The teaching of the apostles, it's great. I read the Bible, you read the Bible, we all read the same Bible. But in addition to Jesus... It's very important for you to start following the rules of our particular religious subculture, which in their case was Jewish. So here was the vibe in the first century church. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you need to get circumcised. That's a non-negotiable. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you need to stop eating bacon right away. You need to wash your hands in a certain way and stop drinking certain kinds of wine. And it all sounded pious. Religious rules always do. So pious that the people in the church started to get sucked in. And the religious people who were making up these rules began to discredit the Apostle Paul, who'd started the church some years earlier. They began to say that Paul's gospel wasn't the real gospel, theirs was. So their story went something like this. Uh, we know what the Apostle Paul told you. But you see, we're not like him. We're from Jerusalem, where it all came from. And we hang out with the Jerusalem apostles, the real ones. And what we're telling you is the real gospel, not like Paul's gospel. And so the real gospel is that all Christians in Jerusalem get circumcised. They all live bacon-free lives. That's normal life for a Christian. And so I know what Paul told you, I know what you believed, but now you need to start following our rules. Everyone follows our rules. They're written in stone. That's how holy people live. And so in the scripture that we're going to look at this morning, Paul starts to hit back and hit back hard at these religious sounding people. For those of you joining us online, welcome to you. Um, you can send your offerings in by mail. Um, we're, I'm just kidding. You can use PayPal too. Um, we're, we're looking at the book of Galatians in the New Testament, chapter 2 and verse 1, which says 14 years later. Uh, 14 years later, um, that is, after Paul had first become a Christian. And during that 14 years, Paul had been figuring out what Christianity was all about. And one of the things that he'd been doing was taking the Christian message outside of its original Jewish context. And because that was working, because large numbers of non-Jews were becoming Christians, the early church had to have a conference to figure out what to do with these non-Jewish Jesus followers. And what was up for discussion at that conference was, is Jesus enough? Or... In addition to Jesus, do we need the rules and the traditions and the customs of the Jewish faith? Is Jesus enough? Or do we need to impose our Jewish traditions on these non-Jewish believers? And so he says in this sentence, I went up to Jerusalem. So he's going to this conference. And he says, I went there with Barnabas, one of his friends. And then he says, I took Titus along also. Now, Titus is important for this discussion because Titus was not a Jew. Titus was a full-bodied, hairy-backed, feta-cheese-eating Greek. 
There was nothing Jewish about him, nothing remotely Jewish about him. Uh, some years earlier, he'd become a Christian, and uh, in his Christian life, he, he was evidently very sincere. Some years earlier, when Paul had a problem with the church in Corinth, he sent Titus to sort it out. A few years after that, when Paul needed to collect money from churches in Turkey to send to the poor folks back in Israel, Titus was the one he trusted with the checkbook. So, so Titus in the early church in the early days is a bit of a uh, strange character. He's a non-Jewish Christian who follows Jesus the Jew. People didn't know what to do with this. So anyway, Paul in the early days he goes to this conference to figure out what to do with these non-Jewish Christians. And he says, I went there in response to a revelation. Remember, one of the things that Paul's keen to emphasize in this letter is that Jesus is the one who called him, Jesus is the one who directs him, and Jesus is the person he wants to talk about, not the church, not the traditions, and not the people in headquarters back in Jerusalem. And hence, he says, I wasn't summoned to appear in Jerusalem like some naughty schoolboy. That's not how it went down. I went up to Jerusalem with my non-Jewish friends because Jesus told me to go. And Jesus told me to sort this issue out. And then he says, I set before them, that is the, the apostles in Jerusalem, the bosses of the church, the gospel that I preach to the Gentiles. In other words, I went there and, you know, I appeared before them like they were judges. And I said, guys, this is what I've been doing the past 14 years. And this is who I've been doing it with. And these are the results. What do you think? And then he adds, I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders. Sounds a bit cheeky, doesn't it? Those who seemed to be the bosses. It sounds insulting, but it isn't. Um, in the ancient world, people spoke this way when they wanted to recognize a fact whilst distancing themselves from that fact. For example... If an American senator spoke in first century Greek language, he might uh, stand up in the Senate and say, those who seemed to be in charge of our country sent our soldiers to fight in Iraq. Uh, what he, uh, by which he would mean, those who were in fact in charge of our country did in fact send our soldiers to fight in Iraq, but I just want to distance myself from those facts. So when he says in this sentence, I spoke to those who seemed to be leaders. He's not saying that Peter and John and all the other bosses were not the real leaders of the church. That's not what he's saying. All he's saying is, these guys are the leaders. These guys were put there by Jesus. But I'm just distancing myself from some of the things that the idiots back in Galatia have been saying about them. Because back in Galatia, all they talk about is these Jewish leaders. And, all the, and their Jewish rules and their Jewish customs. Uh, and, and they talk so much about these things that they've stopped talking about Jesus. And I'm all about Jesus and not about that. Hence he uses this, I want to distance myself, language. And so anyway, he goes to the apostles to, to thrash out the issue of what does it mean for someone outside of our religious subculture to follow our religion. Do they have to adhere to the rules of our subculture and become like us? Or can they just follow Jesus their own way? Can they just do the Christian thing in a way that is appropriate within their culture and their customs? Uh, in other words, if I'm a beer drinking, cigarette smoking, tattoo sporting guy who likes films with explosions in them, and I want to be a Christian, does that mean I have to stop drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and promise not to get any more tattoos and, uh, and, uh, and become a suit-wearing conservative Christian and thereby adhere to the norms of whatever church I end up in? Or can I just follow Jesus my way? Can I just follow Jesus and be true to who I am and where I've ended up in life? That's the discussion. And Paul is concerned about this discussion. Because if this discussion goes the wrong way, 
That means he'll have spent the last 14 years wasting his breath, telling people about Jesus for nothing. And he expresses this concern, notice, by using the imagery of athleticism. He, he says in verse 2, I was afraid that I was running or had run my race in vain. Uh, this is one of those helpful insights into the realities of the Christian life. Uh, when the Bible talks about the normal Christian life, about what you can really expect of Jesus, it predominantly does so by either using the imagery of athletics or of soldiering, both of which you understand are rather exacting, tiring pursuits. Not once, curiously, does the Bible talk about Christianity and use the imagery of the spa. And I'm drawn to the imagery of the spa because that imagery was widely available to the men who first wrote the Bible. And that would have been much better, in my opinion. So you could stand up in church and say, following Jesus, being a Christian, is a bit like, well, it's a bit like when you go to the, to the spa and Jürgen, your masseuse, works on your body. And when Jürgen is done with you, you feel like you've got a brand new body. And then on the way out of the spa, you get yourself fixed up with a cappuccino. And then you feel set up for the day. You feel like a brand new person. That's what it's like to follow Jesus. Let's call it spa theology. Isn't it attractive? And although that very imagery was very accessible to the people who wrote the Bible, that wasn't the imagery they were frequently drawn to. In their descriptions of the Christian life, the imagery that most appealed to them was the imagery of difficulty, the imagery of struggle, of discipline, of, of fighting, of straining. And so he says, I was concerned that I'd put all that effort in, all that race, all that training, all that discipline, and it had all been for nothing. Now when Paul says... I was concerned that I'd run my race in vain. He doesn't mean that he's scared that the apostles will say he's got the gospel wrong. He's just concerned that if the apostles in Jerusalem see the gospel a different way from he does, it'll cause trouble in the church. And trouble in the church is no good. It spoils people. It damages. And so anyway, they have their discussion. And their discussion concluded, verse 3, that not even Titus, the hairy-backed, feta-cheese-eating Greek, not even him, not even him was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. Notice the double use of the word even. Uh, when I was a, a student uh, back in the day, I often used to wonder in a sort of naughty way how this conversation must have gone, gone in Jerusalem, uh, Paul would have appeared before the apostles, a very august uh, audience, and he would have introduced Titus to them. He would have said, uh, apostles, here's my friend Titus. Hello, Titus. How are you? I'm fine. So tell us, Paul, who is this Titus you're introducing us to? Titus is awesome. Titus is a Christian. Really? Really? And does he follow Jesus genuinely? You better believe it. When we had trouble back in the church in Corinth, Titus was the guy who sorted it out for us. When we collected money in Turkey to send to you guys when there was a famine in the Holy Land, he was the guy we trusted with a checkbook. Titus is the man. He's such a sincere Christian that I was actually about to appoint him the first ever Bishop of Crete. That's how awesome he is. The apostles at this point would have stroked their beards and looked approvingly at the young, soon-to-be bishop of Crete. Then the Apostle Paul would have turned to Titus and said, Titus, why don't you show the gentleman your penis? <laughs> because this is the issue. Oh, no. He's uncircumcised. And, so, and the very fact of his uncircumcision creates a conundrum in the minds of all Christians up until this point in history. How can this be? How can he genuinely follow Jesus with such success, with such enthusiasm, with such sincerity and sacrifice, without also following what we've always regarded as being the rules, and the traditions and the customs? It doesn't make any sense to us. This was the cornerstone 
of their religious subculture for the first 20, 30 years of the church's history. And so at one end of the debate, people were saying, if you're going to discover Jesus and follow Jesus, then I'm sorry, you have to make yourself Jewish and do all those things. In just the same way that some churches today say that if you're going to be a Christian, you need to do our way. And that means you need to follow our certain takes on theology and wear certain kinds of clothes to church and avoid certain habits and do certain things and talk in a certain vocabulary. That's the only way. It's our way. And if you're going to follow Jesus, that's part of the package. And then on the other end of the debate, some people were saying, well, no, Jesus is enough. Jesus is all you need. And in Galatia, those, those very religious people were saying quite persuasively, this is how they do it in Jerusalem. And you can imagine how, how easy it would have been for a first century person to get sucked into this. Christianity came from Jerusalem. All the stories took place in Jerusalem. And now these charlatans were saying to the church, this is how it's done in Jerusalem. This is how everyone's doing it. You need to get circumcised, man. You need to stop eating bacon, man. You need to stop drinking all those kinds of wine. I'm this is how it's always done. And so Paul says to the church in Galatia in this sentence, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Because, you see, I had a conversation with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and we decided together, using this Titus the Greek as a test case, that Jesus is enough. And because Jesus is enough, that therefore means that the religious rules of the Jewish subculture or any other subculture you choose to mention are unnecessary. Not to say they're unhelpful, not to say they're bad, but they're unnecessary. And when you think about it, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, here's the rule. And I think these rules of religion really fall apart as soon as you try to apply them and make sense of them. So here's the rule. If you're a Christian, you need to get circumcised. That was the story in the church. No circumcision, no Christianity. Well, let's look at Titus. Is Titus a good Christian? Yes, he is. He's got a book of the Bible named after him. You're probably quite good if you've got a book of the Bible named after you. He, he was trusted with the money of the church. He sorted out problems in the church. He, he was the first ever... Uh, leader of the church in Crete. All of that is true. Now you're telling me that unless he gets circumcised, he won't go to heaven. Is that what you're telling me? You're telling me unless I wear those clothes, unless I use your Bible study methods, <coughs> unless I follow your particular brand of Christianity that, that really was only invented in the 19th century and sing your songs and read your books unless I do that I won't go to heaven sure thing sure thing next sentence this matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ and to make us slaves. Notice the dark imagery. Spies, infiltration, deception. Notice again, Paul is drawn not to the imagery of the spa or of easiness, but to the imagery of war and darkness. Part of the normal Christian life is, is, is a struggle. It is difficulty and it is to embrace those things. And here's something that we ignore in church, or at least we pretend isn't true. Some of the pe normal Christian life, some of the people you meet in church belong under a rock. <laughs> that doesn't apply to this church. <laughs> this church is awesome and everyone's great. But, but, but it's nonetheless true. Some of the people you meet in the course of your Christian life who say Christian things and who, and, and who do Christian things are, are dark people, deceptive people. Horrible people who will do horrible things to you. And when that happens to us, we react as though, oh, this doesn't belong in Christianity. Why is this happening? I think I'll give up on Christianity because Christians are idiots. How many times have you thought that? Okay. I know I have. 
Um, um, <coughs> but such silliness is unnecessary because it's right here in the Bible. The apostle is saying, here's the experience of church. It's dark sometimes. There are stupid people who do stupid things. And that's just normal, unfortunately. Um, so Paul, anyway, Paul calls these people false brothers. Not because they're disingenuous in what they believe. Religious people never are. But rather because what they believe renders them unchristian. Christian is, I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. To, to bear the anger of God for my sins. So that I can be forgiven of my sin and set free from my sin. That's what Christian is. It isn't that plus anything else. It's just that. It's the work of Jesus on the cross for my sin. That's it. Nothing else. No supplements. And if you believe that a Christian is a person who believes in Jesus plus anything else... However pious and sensible that anything else sounds. Whether it's wearing black clothes on a Sunday or not wearing lipstick when you kiss the icons. Or, 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 or avoiding certain habits or believing in dispensational theology or whatever it is you read, read in the latest book you read. Whatever. If you believe it's Jesus plus anything else, then what you believe renders you unchristian. That at least is the view of the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. Um, it makes you a false brother and it makes you wrong, the apostle would say. And insofar as this particular wrongness was, was a bunch of rules and traditions that had to be conformed to, and insofar as that conformity was, was, was in addition to Jesus, Paul says it's an enslavement. It's just an enslavement. We used to be free we used to be able to be open about the fact that there was darkness in our lives and we screwed things up and we were sinners. And we heard about Jesus and we believed in forgiveness and we believed in freedom and it was good. And then these people came along with their rules and their traditions and their customs and it's no fun anymore. Now we're slaves. We're liars and we're hypocrites. It sucks. But it never seems like an enslavement at the time. The things that enslave you never seem obvious. In church, on the contrary, they always seem safe and sensible. We would just prefer it if you dressed up smart on a Sunday. It's just the way we do things. It's respectful to Jesus. We would just prefer it, ladies, if you would sit with your legs straight and cross yourself when you came in the building. It's not in the Bible, but we think it's safer for you and better for us. We think that it's proper if you're going to be a Christian that you never have a beer. We just think that's sensible. And we want you to be safe. We want to protect your Christianity and the church. And, and my view would be of, of every single rule that every single religious person ever wants to ram down our throats is that, you know what, it's hard enough to be a Christian. It's hard enough to do what the Bible actually says without also trying to do what you say too. Right? So anyway, uh, Paul says we had this church and it was good and then people came in with an agenda and their agenda was to make everyone religious like them. And then Paul says, we did not give in to them for a moment. And the reason we did not give in is so that the truth of the gospel might remain in you. You see, it's not a matter of being nice sometimes. Sometimes it's a matter of staying true to what the gospel is. Paul's take here is, this is the gospel. You're a sinner. Jesus died for your sin so that you can be forgiven of your sin and set free from your sin. That's it. It's Jesus on the cross. And if I allow those religious people to come into the church... And start persuading you that you need other rules as well. I will be allowing the integrity of the gospel to be compromised. Hence his Churchillian language. I will not give in. Not for a second. I simply don't have the right to make the faith you've fallen for. 
about something else other than Jesus. Then he says, as for those who seem to be important, he's talking about the apostles here, and again, notice the cheeky language. Those who seemed to be important, whatever they were, makes no difference to me. God doesn't judge by external appearance. These men added nothing to my message. All he's saying here is, I, I, I spoke about this with the apostles. And I heard what they had to say, and they heard what, what I had to say, and there was no argument. There really was no discussion. Hence, after we were finished, they added nothing to my message. I said, here's what I've been doing among the non-Jews. I've, I've been saying to them, it's all about Jesus, and Jesus is enough. And they heard that and said, yeah, that's cool. We agree. It is all about Jesus. Jesus is enough. And so he says, on the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. Then he adds in the last sentence, all they asked, um, he, he isn't saying here that, um, well, there is just one little rule I'd like you to add on. He begins this sentence with an adverb. So, so, he, so he's separating what he's about to say from what he's just said. Um, all they asked was that it's kind of proper for a Christian to continue to remember the poor. And he was like, well, I do that anyway. And I'm eager to do that anyway. So Paul would say to us on a Sunday, here's the test of your Christianity. Here's the, the only litmus test. When you think about your Christianity and whether or not it's genuine, do you think about A... How successfully or unsuccessfully you adhere to the rules and the customs of your religious subculture. The one you were born into or the one you came out of. Or B, do you think about you being a sinner and Jesus' death on the cross being for you so that you can be forgiven? Which is it? Are you a Christian because you do Christian sounding things in your subculture? Or are you a Christian because of Jesus and what he did on the cross for you? It's either or, it can't be both. Okay, Chris. Um, I think the... Thank you. Um, I think the view of society would be that male circumcision is not a crime. Uh, the view of society uh, would be that female circumcision absolutely is a crime. Um, uh, the Christian take from this text would be, you know what? Um, uh, some people get circumcised for, for uh, religious reasons very, very genuinely. Very, very genuinely indeed. And it wouldn't be for us to criticize them. And that certainly wasn't the case in the early church. But... But the huge issue in this text and the huge issue in the early church is this, this sincere rule that people sincerely, albeit in your view wrongly, but nonetheless sincerely believed was an integral part of Christianity. The debate then becomes, is this or is this not an integral part of Christianity? And if it is an integral part of Christianity, what does that say about what happened on the cross? And where does that leave us as sinful people? Now, getting away from circumcision, which 50% of us will be glad to do. <laughs> let's, let's translate that into whatever it was you were told was important. And, and it's different for all of you, depending where you come from. For some of us, it's a habit. For some of us, it's a, it's a stylistic thing. For some of us, it's a, you know, it's a subtle sort of vocabulary thing. For some of us, it's a belief in a certain kind of theology. It was, it was very persuasively put into your head that that was important, that that was necessary. That's the relevance of this debate in our life. If that's true, if what you were told was important really is important, what does that importance say about the cross and about Jesus' death? And where does that leave you as a sinner? That's why I repeatedly say to those of you who are still 
uh, around when I'm on my deathbed, which I hope is none of you. Um, um, please, if you're going to comfort me with anything, don't comfort me with how I've been good or how, I've, how religious I've been or anything like that. Comfort me with Jesus died on the cross for you. It, it's, it's a gambling thing, really. Where are you going to put your chips? Are you going to put your chips on Jesus on the cross? Or are you going to put them on the Jesus on the cross plus all the other religious bits? That's the issue in this text. But, but that was exactly what was happening in this first century church. People who were more religious than you were coming into the church and they were looking at you and they were absolutely judging you in a very critical way. And they were saying, here's what I've noticed about your life. I've noticed this, 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 and this. And what I've noticed means you're not a Christian. And then you might respond and say, well, I am a Christian because Jesus died on the cross for me and I believe that. And they would say, well, no, that's not enough. That's the issue. Let's leave it there. Let's leave it with Jesus on the cross. Let's leave it with that being enough to deal with our sin and make us right with the only judge who matters. Fair play. God bless you. More on this next Sunday. We'll pick up with the next sentence. Have a great week. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>